Dr. Jason Rivers, our guest. He's a dermatologist. He has his own practice in Vancouver, Pacific Dermesthetics. Mm -hmm. And you're an inventor of sorts because you've invented your own skincare line. And what's different about a reversal from something else? How did all this begin? Well, interestingly, it started about uh, a decade ago, and I was um, introduced to a molecule called thuyaplicin or henocatol, which... Easy for you to say. Right. That's why you graduated magna <laughs> cum laude. I can't even say that. <laughs> no. <laughs> but the, the issue was is that this came from the red cedar tree, and I was... Um, I met with some people from the Department of Forestry at UBC who told me about uh, the molecule, that they were trying to extract it from the red cedar tree, and that they were working on a uh, veterinary line at the time. Um, but uh, that Great. wasn't going anywhere. So I was interested <laughs> mm -hmm. in it, just from a, a scientific basis. And just by chance, I met um, a chemist who said, I can put stuff together for you. And we started fiddling around and putting some stuff together. And I thought it was just going to be a one-off thing. Mm -hmm. And people started saying to me, well, where do I get this stuff? And I said, well, it doesn't exist. Right. And um, what I was trying to do uh, was motivated by the fact that people were constantly saying to me, you know, what do I put on my skin? What's a good product? What's, what should I not do? Mm -hmm. And it was becoming like a sure. broken record. What's a natural product? Yeah, What's I mean, a not so natural product? But the problem is that you see that most, if you look at a, an ingredient list at the drugstore of a product that you're going to put on your skin, 99.8% of people have no clue what's in the package. Mm -hmm. They don't know what's working, what's not working, what's useful, what's not useful. So I said, myself, well, here's some things that I know will be useful in a product. Here's things that I don't want in a product because they can cause allergies. And um, the thing came together. And just by word of mouth, people started asking for mm -hmm. this. And five years ago, we formed a company and it grew basically by word of mouth until recently where we were joined by another group called Institute B. And they're helping us now um, develop this and market it for rosacea okay. because people have rosacea, have sensitive skin, and this product line is generally well suited to people who have sensitive skin. Okay, so what is rosacea? Rosacea is a, this is like an exam. <laughs> I know, I know. Rosacea. I know you can pass. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, rosacea <laughs> is a very common condition. It affects about two million Canadians. It's characterized by redness of the face and flushing that lasts for about more than three months at a time. So people who often get um, out in a public situation and they go beet red mm -hmm. if they're embarrassed or if there's wind or they have a glass of wine. You can test that with your next guest. Right. Uh, um, <laughs> whether or not, you know, if you go red after you drink mm -hmm. wine or have spicy foods, that's usually a sign of rosacea. It occurs more in women than men, but men can have it. More common in fair-skinned Celtic kind of individuals. Mm -hmm. But again, you can have it in dark-skinned individuals as well. And people can be very... Um, uh, self-conscious about it. Uh, surveys have looked at people who have rosacea, and about 75% right. of people say it does impact on their quality of life. And all levels of uh, severity, I'm sure, because you see some people who are constantly flushed and right. red, and others who just flush occasionally. You can blush and not have rosacea, Exa right? Exactly. And the other mm -hmm. thing is that um, you know people often confuse it with acne, adult acne, because you can get pus pimples with rosacea. But even in the most severe forms, you can get the old W.C. Fields nose. I'm right. not sure if young people know who W.C. Fields was, but, you know, the big kind of big bulbous, bulbous nose. Big bulbous, red nose. Exactly. Mm. And is it reversible? Or do you live with it for life? Well, rosacea is a chronic condition. We don't have a cure for it at this time because the actual cause for it is not no. fully understood. Stood, yeah. but Inflammatory uh, disease of any sort? Yeah. And um, I'll explain that in a sec if you okay. want. But basically, you can control the symptoms in many people. If you avoid those factors which aggravate it, you can make things better. Avoid wine, you mean? Reduce. Your reduce. <laughs> okay, not all the way, but uh, reduce uh, intake of wine or anything that yeah, causes it, you to yeah, flush right. a lot. And some people, they can drink white wine. They can't drink red wine. Mm. So you may have to switch to a... Well, exactly. And we're able to do that. Uh, broken capillaries, uh, something that is genetic uh, because you've had too much wind or sun or what? Well, oftentimes it's from the sun um, and wind, uh, but it's usually also in a situation like rosacea, you can get the same thing where people are flushing and um, getting red a lot. The vessels open up and close. Eventually they stay open. Mm -hmm. And in those situations where you have dilated capillaries, then we have to use lasers to really shrink them down. So if you shrink them, do they completely go away or? The improvement's about 80% or so, mm -hmm. and they will stay away for a few years usually. Um, but 
you know, if you're constantly getting exposed to the sun or having the stimuli that make you flush, it's going to come back. Okay, and what's the downtime for that? For laser? Yes. Um, you'll be red for a couple of days. You could be puffy for a couple of days. So, you know, if you did it on a Thursday, you're generally fine by Monday. And do you work on legs too, like broken capillaries on you legs? Can, or? You can, but oftentimes for those, we'll use an injectable um, sclerosin. So we'll mm. use like um, um, concentrated salt solutions or sugar solutions, and they cause an irritation inside the blood vessels, and it causes them to collapse. Uh, what can't you use laser for, in, in essence? I mean, I know it's bloodless surgery, but... Um, it, well, the first thing you have to know is that lasers are lights, and each laser has a specific wavelength, so it has a specific target. And I use an analogy, so if, for example, if you have a laser that works only on red, I can take a red balloon and put it inside a white balloon, and if I fire the laser, the white balloon will be left intact, and the red balloon inside it will blow up. Mm -hmm. So by the same analogy, when you are treating things, you have to have a target. So at this point in time, lasers will treat many things, blood vessels, pigmentation, uh, scarring in the skin, um, all kinds of different things. Uh, what it won't do at this juncture well is treat fat, for example. So people are now looking at lasers and light energy devices that will actually cause fat to involute because that's mm. the next frontier body contouring. I bet it is. Uh, it always says to me when we talk about this that you must go to somebody who knows what they're doing. Who's watching over? The pe it's, uh, there are a lot of people, it seems, getting into uh, skin care. That's right. <laughs> you know, making people look younger. And I don't think all of them have all the credentials. You're absolutely right. There is very little in the way of control and it's really caveat emptor. You know, buyer mm. beware that you have to really uh, look at the people who are doing it. There are a lot of places where technicians are doing treatments, and um, I heard of something the other day where somebody told me they went to a place where there is somebody doing Botox, and they've, the patient never met the doctor. And so you do have to ask yourself, you know, mm. what is being regulated? Although these things might seem simple to do, um, there are issues that you have to understand, sure. the anatomy, side effects, and complications. Well, if somebody was a neurosurgeon and de decided to do laser, I think I might take that. But if somebody was an esthetician, right. I, but would that be allowed under the regs? Well, the problem is you see that physicians are very closely monitored to some degree, but mm -hmm. even people who are doing cosmetic medicine don't have to do any specific training for that. They can put up a shingle and get uh, experience through meetings. So many are very competent. Right. The, on the other hand, if somebody is an esthetician and they're treating you with a laser and they cause a problem, there's nothing you can do except sue that individual and they, it doesn't mean that they can't continue mm. to, to practice. Okay, so ask a lot of questions. Ask a lot mm -hmm. of questions. Where do you weigh in on the vitamin D? Uh, well, vitamin D I think is important, um, but uh, interestingly there was a paper that was published just at the end of last year which was a summation of work um, analyzed by 14 of the top leading experts in the field from around the world and they published this and the bottom line is that there's evidence to show that vitamin D is very important for bone health. Mm -hmm. There's limited information at this time to suggest that it's going to prevent every cancer known to mankind. That being said, I think that there is also sufficient information at this time to say that people are not getting enough vitamin D and that this should be supplemented. And people say, well, I might as well just get out in the sun longer. Um, the key thing to know about sunlight is this, is that, first of all, sun still causes skin cancer and people die every day from skin cancer. Second of all, the sun will age your skin. And third of all, once your body gets enough vitamin D in it for the day, it turns off. You don't get more. So 15 minutes exposure of your arms, legs, a couple times a week is all you need. Without sunscreen. Without sunscreen. But that being said, for two cents a day, you can take a vitamin D pill, mm -hmm. and that will help you. And, and also the important thing to know is that a lot of the studies that are talking about cancer prevention, um, health information with vitamin D relate to dietary intake of vitamin D, not sun exposure. Okay, and when, when you put a sunscreen on and the, look at the ingredients before you put the sunscreen on, what ingredients do you not put on your body? Well, it depends. Or do you look out for? <clears throat> well, it depends. Most uh, sunscreens at this point in time are, as we understand it, safe in the sense that the chemical ingredients in them, the molecules in them, 
are not known to cause cancer or mutations into cells. The, um, there are certain chemicals, though, that are thought to be what are called endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. One of them is called benzophenone, right. uh, which goes in sunscreen. So that would be better not to have it in a sunscreen. Okay, and I know the jury goes <coughs> in and out about PABA. Well, PABA is sort of long gone because it's a sulfa derivative, mm -hmm. and people were getting allergic to it. But there are other ingredients that you can use, and um, all kinds of information now are happening. For example, the Health Canada is big against using nanoparticles on the skin, which are very small molecule size uh, ingredients for zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Very little information that they cause any problems, but they're being banned from sunscreen use. Yet there's still a number of sunscreens out there that have these ingredients in them. Right. Well, nice to see you again. Pleasure, Penny. Thank you. Dr. Jason Rivers from Pacific Derma Aesthetics.